Uh, thank you. Welcome to this webinar on uh, hydrogen physics, the groundwater surface uh, water sur water interface. So together, me, uh, Emin uh, Sadakhov, I'm chair of um, uh, Europe Regional Advisory, uh, SGS Europe Regional Advisory Committee. And uh, Sinan Sanyan is the chair of the uh, hydrogen physics committee. And uh, we are pleased to um, to have um, to present a webinar on hydrogen physics, the groundwater surface uh, water interface, and uh, Sina, you take it forward, right, with the um, introduction. Paul. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Imin. Uh, I'm Sirius Anian, as uh, Imin just introduced me, uh, head of uh, chair of the hydrogen physics subcommittee at SCG, and we are very uh, glad to have uh, Paul McLachlan uh, uh, here to discuss uh, his recent research on. Uh, uh, TEM characterizing uh, groundwater surface water interface. Uh, Paul is a postdoctoral researcher at the Arpus University in Denmark. Uh, he has completed his PhD in 2019 in Lancaster University, United Kingdom, where he focused on geophysical characterization of groundwater surface water interactions. He has a lot of expertise in uh, electromagnetic induction. He's one of the lead uh, authors of uh, EMAGPI, the open source software for uh, uh, electromagnetic induction, inversion, and character uh, data processing. Uh, uh, during his time at Aarhus, he, he has been involved in water resource, uh, resource projects uh, in both Europe and Africa, uh, and uh, he is going to discuss his uh, find, recent findings with us. Uh, without further ado, Paul, thank you for joining. <clears throat> yeah, hi, thanks, Tina, and thanks to everybody attending. Um, yeah, so as Sina said, Sina said, sorry, um, I'm going to be talking about some of some recent work looking at uh, groundwater and how it maybe interacts with surface water in, a, in three settings. Um, so I've got a few co-authors here I'd like to thank um, in the title and also, so some of them are based in Aarhus and also some international experience and, and collaborators uh, specifically in Zimbabwe and and South Africa who have made this work possible. Um, but before I get into things, I thought it maybe it's interesting to give a background. So maybe where my research ideas are coming for uh, and why I'm interested in this sort of topic of research. So these pictures are from actually back when I was doing my PhD in Lancaster. And as you can see, I did a lot of work in, in streams and rivers, um, looking at quite small scale processes. So looking at where groundwater is upwelling into the stream uh, and looking at uh, small scale temporal dynamics. Um, as Sina also mentioned, I was, uh, I've been injured my PhD. I, I developed along with another co-author this frequency domain open source code. And also in the beginning, uh, I was a little bit involved in Resipi. So this is kind of uh, an overview of what I've been up to. Uh, but now moving on to where I'm now. So I'm now based in, in Aarhus University in the hydrogeophysics group. And this is a, a group dedicated to research and development in electrical, electromagnetic and, and NMR methods. And it's quite a big group uh, comprising generally of around 20, 20 people. Yeah, including PhD students, postdocs, technicians and, and software programmers. Good. Um, yeah, but to begin with, I'm going to talk about what's actually motivating this this talk and um, what I, what I'm actually going to present. And I'm going to talk about some methods. So I'm going to talk about how we can use TEM methods. So continuing the continuing the program that Dennis started last time, where Dennis talked about. Um, uh, static and roaming. TM methods. I'm going to I'm going to continue this on this theme with talking about some other TM methods, and also how we might integrate that with remote sensing. And then I'm going to focus on three case studies. Uh, so some pollution pathways in Grinstel, Denmark, thinking about then drinking water and and good quality drinking water in the Savi River Valley in Zimbabwe, and then we'll finalise with looking at some declining lake levels in Sabaya in South Africa. Yeah, but in terms of what, what do I mean when I say groundwater surface water interface or groundwater surface water interactions? Well, 
It's widely known, understood now that, that groundwater and surface water are very closely interconnected and the interactions uh, have important implications for water uh, and the, the physical and chemical characteristics of aquatic environments. So if we want to better manage water or understand resources, maintain ecological health and ensure uh, good quality water for humans, we actually need to understand how these two bodies of water are interacting with another and one another. Yeah, and to do that, we need to. Uh, we need to really use a integrated set of approaches, and I think geophysics is a really nice tool for, for doing this because we can get very high spatial characterization of the subsurface and we can even maybe look into some dynamic properties. Uh, using geophysics. Yeah, and this image here is just showing different different scales of, of groundwater surface water interactions. So you might think about regional flow paths that take maybe tens or hundreds of years um, and might pick up some nasty pollutants or, or chemicals within the groundwater and they might actually then discharge into the stream. So predicting where those those pathways are going and actually the time they'll take to reach the stream is an important uh, factor. We also might consider more local scale paths, so more more regular groundwater surface water exchanges between the stream and the shallow groundwater. If we can understand uh, those dynamics as well, then then we can uh, better conceptualize our system. And of course, in all cases, uh, the geological structure of these these settings is very important because they're going to uh, to a large extent dictate flow paths and the rate or the timing of these interactions. So I've got these three nice images that I, I pulled off of uh, Google Google Images just to kind of highlight in more detail uh, the case studies that I'm, I'm going to show you and also uh, put them in the context of groundwater surface water interactions. So in the case uh, of this first image, what we've got is we've got a landfill site and we've got uh, pollution leaching down from the landfill, undergoing a variety of, of chemical transformations and polluting the aquifer and maybe at some point also reaching into the river. Yeah, so it's important if we know the flow path of this of this pollution plume and we, we want to understand uh, where it's going to interact with surface water bodies and uh, the timing of such. Uh, the second case, so we're going to move to Zimbabwe and we're going to think about shallow uh, groundwater exchanges with surface water. So we want to know, for example, where where this where there's a good quality drinking water, basically. In the case of Zimbabwe, that happens uh, in the Savi River when we have um, frequent interactions of the of the surface water and shallow shallow groundwater. Um, and quite often from an ecological point of view, this is referred to as the riparian zone. So uh, an area where we can we can support um, trees and, and bushes uh, proximal to surface water bodies. Uh, yeah, and then the last case is going to be in South Africa and we're going to consider a lake and its connection to the groundwater. So there's an interesting lake there where over the last 20 or so years, there's been an eight meter drop in the lake level, and we're going to going to look at some initial data from that site. Oh. Mm, frozen. OK. Sorry. We will look at uh, the TM, TM methods and remote sensing methods now. OK, so why geophysics and remote sensing? So if we look at this picture here, this is a, a picture showing the, the different depth of investigation and horizontal extent of investigation of, of different methods. And we are going to focus on transient electromagnetic methods and, and remote sensing methods. So if we think about transient electromagnetic methods, we can sense uh, from depths of uh, a few, maybe five meters or so down to down to depths of uh, hundreds of meters. 
And if you remember from Dennis's talk, and as we'll look at in this talk, we can actually uh, have quite a large horizontal extent of these investigations. So maybe in the order of tens of kilometers with some mobile systems. If we then look at uh, remote sensing methods instead, uh, we're much we're sensitive to a much shallower region of the subsurface, so maybe only the top meter or so, but we can actually have a, a much uh, larger spatial scale. So maybe limited actually by the, the surface area of the planet or so. Um, yeah, or or the scale of interest, of course, if we if we wanting to, to focus on quite a small catchment or a, a river valley, then then we can we can do that no problem with some remote sensing methods. OK, and I think these tools are very, very complementary because uh, geophysics provides very high spatial resolution at, at relatively fast speeds. Uh, whereas remote sensing tools cover a large area and, and regular in regular intervals, so we can get uh, updated snapshots of. Of the surface. Uh, and these both of these methods are particularly useful in, in data scarce countries, so areas where we have maybe poor understanding of the subsurface geology and therefore of the subsurface hydrology. OK. Uh, let's, so let's look at the TM method to begin with. So the TM method in, in straightforward terms consists of a, a red transmitter coil and a yellow receiver coil shown here in this in this diagram. Oh. And what we do is we pass a steady current around this red coil and that's going to induce a primary electromagnetic field uh, that we see with these yellow field lines. Then what we do is we switch this current off very abruptly, and this creates some inductive eddy currents in the subsurface that, that propagate down. And these um, eddy currents generate a, a secondary magnetic field that then induces a, a current in this, this inner yellow loop, so this yellow receiver. And the property of the, the secondary magnetic field are very much dependent on the, the distribution of subsurface resistivity. So if we've got a very conductive earth or we've got a very resistive earth, we can see this in our recorded data. And I've got some nice uh, GIFs here just uh, highlighting that. So in the case of a homogeneous 100 ohm meter earth, we see the these eddy currents propagating through time uh, in the subsurface. And these will these will generate a secondary magnetic field that is then sensed by a by a receiver coil. And this might be an example of of some of the data that we actually get back uh, within the computer systems uh, on the back of this quad bike here. Uh, if we've got heterogeneous air earth like this, we can also visualize how these eddy currents propagate through the subsurface. Um, so they, they move, move relatively. Uh, yeah, they move differently, basically through different resistivities, and we can we can see this expressed in, in the data. Yeah. And if we know the theoretical response. Um, of our method, we can then backtrack and we, we can uh, calculate what resistivity distribution we might have for our, our given uh, measured response. Yeah. So we can get these layered one dimensional models of electrical resistivity, and then what we can do is we can translate them into to models that are relevant to uh, or hydrogeologically relevant. So in Denmark, we're faced with quite a, a, a classical um, geology in Denmark is we've got a combination of sandy and and till or clay rich glacial sediments and underlying all that you've got quite a, a fat thick palagine clay and these these have pretty typical resistivity values so so this clay here um, is typically characterized by ohm meter uh, 10 ohm meters or in that order so whereas if we move away to the higher end of the scale uh, 320 ohm meters that might be more associated with unsaturated sand or gravel uh, so this is kind of the the signal the signatures we typically see in Denmark. Yeah, of course there's going to be some variability based on if we've got different ion contents of the pore water, or if we've got contaminants in the pore water, or if we've got varying porosity and and saturation. 
Um, and it's very important when we move away from Denmark and move into more remote settings that we actually have a good control on the geology so that we can actually do some one to one comparisons. Of the structure. Um, and that's going to become apparent um, when I move on to the two African case studies. Yeah. So just as an overview, uh, I'm going to be talking about data collected with this T10 system. So in this case, we've got a transmitter coil here with a, a length dimension, sorry, of about 2.9 by 2.9 meters. And then trailing behind, we've got a receiver coil with a physical dimension of one by one meter. Um, yeah, and they're they're pulled with a an ATV or a quad bike. Um, but I think it's better just to show you a video. So this is a video in Zimbabwe, actually, where we're we're continuously collecting data, generally at driving speeds of around 15 to to 20 kilometers, maybe even up to 25 kilometers an hour. So very high productivity collection of data. Um, and we're continuously uh, measuring so we're, we can get a continuous image of the subsurface resistivity. Um, now, typically we're able to characterize in the order of 25 to 75 kilometers uh, per day. That might correspond to around 50 or 150 hectares per day. But that's very dependent on land access. Um, and I think the, well, at least the, the highest I've highest I've been involved in, we managed to map 108 kilometers a day, and that corresponds to an area of roughly 300 hectares. So that was quite a long productive day making use of the, the Danish summer time where we might have uh, 13, 14 hours of, of daylight. Now this system is, is quite nice because we can actually see up to maybe 100 meters depth. Um, and depending on the driving speed, we can, we can get lateral resolution up maybe in the order of three to five meters. So we have a one dimensional model of the resistivity every three to five meters. Um, now, when we're thinking about surface water bodies, it's also nice if we can we can actually collect data on on lakes or in rivers. And this is exactly what's going on in this picture here. So um, there's been a few few examples in the past in Denmark and Mississippi, maybe maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, some previous publications on regarding this, but we can adapt the system and actually float it on um, either paddle boards or, or rubber dinghies. And this is what's going on here in South Africa, where we're uh, prepping a system to to be towed on water. Yeah, and this is one of my colleagues uh, enthusiastically pumping up these paddle boards. Yeah, and this is a, a video of it in action. This is another colleague we have working in GG Africa in, in uh, South Africa. And we can see that if we've got very nice calm water, then this system handles very well, uh, nice and smooth uh, across the surface of the lake. And again, just as before, we've got the, the electronics uh, responsible for sending currents around this transmitter loop. And we've also got electronics responsible for receiving the signal from this receiver coil at the back. Mm -hmm. And during these surveys as well, we're typically interested in um, measuring the electrical conductivity of the surface water and also the depth. So we've got an echo echo sounder to actually know where the riverbed is or the lake bed. Sorry. Yeah, and we've got some maybe you can see it here. You've got some pool noodles here in the background. Um, just to stop these cables actually going into the propellers, which which worked quite well. OK, and lastly, in terms of TM methods, we've also got uh, a stationary system and Dennis uh, last month also talked about this. And in this setup, we might have a, a 50 by 50 meter transmitter loop and maybe a five by five or a 10 meter receiver coil in the middle. And we can use a system measure maybe for 15 minutes or 20 minutes in a stationary position, we can look up to depths of three, 400 meters, maybe. And these are very nice to complement the, the mobile methods. Okay. Uh, as in addition to some of the work I've been doing with TM, I've also been using some, some remote sensing products. So this is made actually very easy 
using uh, with the Google Earth engine. So uh, this is some Python wrapper to access this data or there's a, a JavaScript approach to also download this data, but everything is nicely curated in the one area and we can actually quite easily access this data. Um, yeah, so I'm mainly going to show you some NDVI and NDWI images uh, what I've been using for some of my work and they're they're in they're short for normalized difference vegetation index and normalized difference wetness index uh, images. Uh, we can also get surface temperature data, climate and weather, precipitation, land cover, and also some digital elevation models and, and drainage networks can actually be derived from some of these products, which are all very useful in, in um, uh, helping to provide additional information to our area of interest. This is just a nice picture here. Um, so this is this is how NDVI is calculated. It's a, a ratio of the near infrared and the red bands of of satellite images. And this this image up here is showing nicely how um, how different vegetation might might appear in these images. So if we've got an index of above uh, sixty six percent, we might see we might attribute this to very healthy plants. And as we move into zero uh, to thirty three percent or even below zero, we might be we might uh, match this to a, a dead or a, a a struggling plant. And this is very nice um, if we're looking for water resources, actually, because it means we can we can identify areas that have at least a stable supply of of shallow groundwater. So this is an image from a recent paper published in 2023. Uh, I was not involved in this. This was just a, a nice image I found online in in Ghana, where they were comparing some NDVI images from 2000 and 2001, and we see a nice green riparian zone tracking down the river. And then uh, again, the same image for 20 years later, and we can see that there's been um, a reduction in the in the NDVI values, and we've got a much a much um, less healthy riparian zone and, and maybe therefore less shallow groundwater available. OK, so NDWI as well. This is also a very nice metric for characterizing uh, the, the presence of surface water on uh, on landscapes. Yeah, so we can go from this image here. This is a, a false color image of of a meandering river dating back to 1985, so some Landsat, I think Landsat 5 data. Uh, and we can see very clearly in this fake false color image, the, the meandering river, but we can also actually translate that into a, into a binary image uh, or an N NDVWI uh, image where we can see it nicely this meandering channel. So we can get a, an idea of the dynamic nature of, of surface water systems and maybe we can also actually pinpoint at what times throughout the year we've got surface water present in, in landscapes and uh, if there's any changing trends uh, over over long periods of time. OK, yeah, and this is uh, just a, a snapshot of some remote sensing instruments that are actually available. Um, yeah, and I've mainly been using data from Landsat 5, Landsat 7 and of, of Sentinel 2, which is a launched uh, in early 2015 by by uh, the European uh, European Space Agency. OK, so that's an overview of the methods and uh, now I'm going to move into some case studies, which is probably the more interesting part of this talk. So I'm going to first focus on looking at pollution pathways in, in, in Grinstel in Denmark. Um, so yeah, this is Grinstel in Denmark, so so southern or Southern uh, Denmark here. Aarhus is situated around here somewhere. And the rest of Europe, uh, Germany and so on is, is to the south. Um, yeah, but this is a, a heavily polluted landfill site. Um, that was active from the 1930s to, to the 1970s, and that's this landfill here just south of the Grinstill town. Maybe two to three kilometers south of the town. There's no scale bar on this map. Now, 
uh, from 1924 to, to 2012, this, this uh, factory here was very active in producing pharmaceutical and, and food industry waste. And a lot of that waste uh, made it to the, the Grinstall landfill site, particularly be between 1962 and 1977. A lot of organic uh, waste was added uh, to the landfill, in total around 85,000 tonnes. Yeah, oops. Um, so the, these, um, these uh, pollutants were mainly added to the north part of the, the of the landfill here. It's misspelled factory, but that's OK. Um, yeah, so uh, during the, the 1900s, there was um, a lot of pollutants added to this northern part of the factory. Sorry, northern part of the landfill. Um, and these a lot of these pollutants have then made their way down into the quaternary and neogene sands. And it's anticipated that seepage uh, through the groundwater might continue for for hundreds of years. And the the main concern in this area was that, uh, so first of all, which direction is the plume going? Is it going this way towards the stream, or is it maybe going more northwards towards the stream? And uh, how can we actually monitor and mitigate any of this pollution into the surface water? Yeah. So this. Um, Grinstall stream and, and lake system. There's a lake just off the map here. This is uh, artesian, so the, there's upwelling into this river. So it's quite a concern that some of this pollution might might end up making its way into the stream eventually. Um, yeah, so initial conceptual model, initial hydrological model of this site was that um, some of the pollutants were, were moving kind of to the north uh, so northeast, northwest, sorry. And this is this is depth to different uh, formations within the in the subsurface. So uh, to the upper quaternary, so zero to ten meters below the surface. Uh, then then the, the lower quaternary, twenty to ten to twenty meters below the surface, and then down into the neogene. Uh, Odorup formation. So this was kind of some initial modeling that was done to understand how the, the pollutants are actually moving into the aquifer and then eventually towards uh, the the lake. Yeah, and these are just some images here, uh, some arrows here showing this pollution pathway. Now, to, to better understand um, where exactly this pollution was going, some we did some TTEM mapping. So some TTEM mapping of this area. So the white dots here are showing uh, every location of a TTEM model. And the idea was to try and track where this, this landfill plume is going. So using um, roughly 10 to 25 meter spacing between each line, uh, between each uh, driving line, and around about 10 meter spacing in the driving direction, we were able to cover this, this 250 hectare area in around uh, three days. And what we see here is some some mean resistivity maps uh, going down different slices through the subsurface. So in this first map here, we see uh, the interval of five to ten meters below this the surface. In this interval, we see the the average resistivity of twenty to twenty five meters below the surface, uh, and so on, thirty to forty meters below the surface, and eighty to ninety meters below the surface. So these maps are are nice in giving us a kind of spatial understanding of of geology or maybe pollutants within the groundwater. And there's a few a few uh, features that that jump out here. So the first one maybe we can see is in the top five to ten meters. We see this conductive layer here. Now this is not actually related to pollution. This is actually related to um, a mica a mica rich so a clay rich uh, sand up here. So this is producing quite a conductive anomaly. In in this image here. But if we move to the 20 to 25 interval, looking at the just north of the landfill site, which is here, we can see this conductive anomaly here. So this this region of low resistivity. And this is where the this is uh, associated with this pollution plume. If we go to even deeper depth, so between the 30 and 40 meter interval, we can actually see this this pollution plume um, 
here, so spreading out at depth. And we can get a good idea of actually the, the morphology and the spatial extent of this plume. And we can maybe even see it uh, down here as well, uh, far, further down away from the, the uh, landfill. Now, of course, with TM method, we're not really able to survey very well in, in built up areas. So, so that's why we don't have good coverage uh, where, the, where the towns are. But nonetheless, we can actually see at least the beginning of the plume and we can take note of the direction it's traveling. Um, and I'll just show you this. I'm going to show you a transect actually going from here all the way uh, down towards the lake. Yeah, so this is a 2.6 kilometer transect with the, the landfill up here somewhere. And we can see this very high conductivity, low resistivity plume migrating through the subsurface. Yeah, and maybe thinning out uh, down here. Yeah, so we can see that the the main part of the plume is is situated here. Good. Oops, that's fine. And these boreholes, I mean, there's a lot of information in these boreholes, but in summary, most of the most of the layers here are sand. At the bottom, we see some some uh, silt layers, uh, some clay layers. Sorry, but most of these uh, layers up above are are sand related. Yeah, just different types of of um, highly permeable uh, sediment. Okay, so we can then un update the the conceptual model of Grinstall actually. So we we can go from the Id an initial idea that the pollution was moving this way and we can actually update this and, and we can say the pollution is now moving more towards the north. Um, yep. So in conclusion, we can we can accurately map where this fan is going and we can actually install some targeted boreholes within this within this zone. So we can spend the money where it matters and install some boreholes here. And we can also prevent installation of, of uh, other boreholes that were outside of the plume location because um, these are costly, maybe up to 72,000 US dollars to install deep monitoring and remediation wells. So, so money can be saved by, by doing this quick um, TTEM survey. And we can also get a uh, we can also have better protection of the Grinstall River and Lake system. Yeah. Good. So let's move on now to Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe, we did some field work in in the Savi River Valley, which is down here. And I'm going to talk about South Africa afterwards. That's that's located here while well, we've got the map up. Um, but in some in Zimbabwe, we 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 measured in five communities communities with some some TTEM and we collected around 170 to 170 line 160 to 170 line kilometers of data in around about five and a half days of field work and the white points here represent where we've driven this TTEM data and we've collected this TTEM data and the blue points indicate where we collected some stationary TEM so looking deeper we also uh, see some boreholes in here uh, marked in red. So quite limited knowledge about the geology in this area. So that's why it's, it's nice to rely on some geophysics. Um, yeah, let's quickly go through some nice remote sensing uh, images we've collected from this, this site. So in this image here, I'm showing you a map of, of the surface water cover as a percentage. This is a percentage through time. So if we have, for example, if we have deep blues uh, it, indicating 80%, that means that over the last, since uh, 2015, we've had 80% of the time this land has been covered in surface water. This uh, color scale is actually cropped 80. So some of some of these um, features are actually all, all the time there. So 100% of the time we have surface water. And then that means that we've also, we can also identify areas, for example, that we've got these uh, extreme or, or irregular flooding events, and we can see actually new channels forming. So this is, it gives a nice overview of the last eight or so years of uh, the surface water dynamics in this area. To the left, sorry, to the right, we've got a, a map of the average 
uh, normalized difference vegetation index through time. And we can see that we've got very green areas, particularly around this main river channel uh, coming down here. And we've also, we can also identify some irrigation points. Yeah. So that that's maybe a good, that would be a good target to look for some shallow groundwater, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think just to zoom in on some of these areas, that's that's of interest. So here we can see, we can actually identify this reservoir, which has an area of about 200 by 200 meters, which which shows up as this really deep blue which might be actually quite hard to detect in the, the standard aerial imagery. So these metrics are actually very useful in pinpointing locations. Um, we also can identify these perennial wetland type features called uh, dambos. And these are cases where we've got some, we've occasionally got surface water throughout the year. Uh, and again, oh, they're kind of visible in the, in the aerial imagery, but if we actually convert this data into some NDWI plots, we can actually really, really strongly see these, these features. And the interesting thing about these, these features is that actually the geology around these areas as dictate, as detected from the TTEM was actually very clay rich. So these were very conductive environments. Um, yeah, so low, low infiltration in these areas. So when we've got heavy rainfall events, we get uh, collection in in these these features. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, these were not so good uh, drinking water supplies because they quite they smell quite bad and there's a lot of animals uh, drinking from them. So although there's surface water present here, they don't really represent good good uh, water resources. Um, but maybe in terms of water resources, we can look back at these these channel features. So again, we can see this nice strong channel coming through the through the river valley, and that's quite often associated with very high greenness indexes around the the river. Um, uh, this is quite a wide. So this uh, at this point here, this air this river is about 350 meters wide. So this is it's quite a big system we're seeing. It's, uh, this scale bar, yeah, well, maybe it's better to have a specific scale bar. Anyway, 350 meters wide here or so. And we can also identify areas that are active during certain times of the year. So yeah, that's a, a good a good uh, a good idea to have, a good thing to have from our from our field area. Um I'll skip ahead for in interest of time. So I'm gonna now show you some TM data from uh, Tongagara refugee camp, and that was this box up in the north of the area here. Yep, so I'm showing you three profiles. So this this map here is extending for roughly seven kilometers in, in the north south and about 12, 12 kilometers in the east west. And I'm showing you three pro, uh, profiles A in blue, uh, B in orange here, which is this profile here, and C in green here and see wraps around from here all the way back up here. Yeah. Um, OK, and these these profiles are pretty long, so this is seven kilometers, uh, seven kilometer transect, and this one is almost it'd be just over 11 kilometers, this profile C. So these are very, very extensive uh, transects, so we can get quite a nice idea of the, the subsurface structure of the of these settings. So the first thing I'm going to point your attention to is these resistive features. Ah, oh, where's the color? Maybe the color bar is on a different slide. Uh, yeah. So the color, so these these red colors, these are corresponding to resistivity of above 100 or around 200 ohm meters, and we've got also conductive units in in blue down to one ohm meter or so. But I'm just going to highlight your attention on these these resistive features to begin with. So this one here is roughly corresponding along this line here. Uh, yeah, and in profile B, this resistive feature is again seen seen here. And in profile C, uh, this resistive feature is actually up here, um, along here, and then and we can see accurately the position of that based on these these walk them 
these uh, sorry stationary temp soundings. Yeah, so these are the ones. These are the measurements where we did a stationary uh, TM sounding, and we are seeing much deeper with these data. But they, in general, they correspond very well with this uh, TM data. Yeah, we're seeing the same horizons and the same general features. Okay. So those are the resistive features and they actually, if we plotted them out, especially we, we actually see some sort of snaking channel structures uh, coming across this region. Yeah, so we can get an idea of the large scale structure. Um, yeah, we can also identify these conductive areas as well. Um, I've, I've pointed out these ones here. So again, these conductive, uh, where are these on the map? The this this one, uh, I guess, is is uh, in this area up here. Um, in profile B, we're seeing this conductive anomaly uh, actually as we drive down this part of the transect, and in profile C, we're seeing some conductive anomaly at the end of the transect and also at the beginning of the transect. So down here. And you'll notice as we move towards the river, this second layer actually becomes uh, has, has a lower resistivity. So we go from resistivities of one towards resistivities of of ten or so as we move uh, out towards the river. I think it's also important to note that of the few boreholes we actually have of this area, the the geophysics and the geology matches quite well. So in this log, what we have is we've got um, some some clay top soil shown in brown and orange. Then we move into what's logged as alluvial aquifer in the borehole. Uh, sorry, an alluvial deposit in the in the borehole in yellow. And then we move into some more um, a, a sandstone in the in this uh, pinky uh, color. And that that very, that agrees very well with the geophysical structure of the area. Um, okay. And I think also nicely what we can see specifically along profile C. So in this area down here, we can see kind of a two layer system. Uh, so we can go in, we can go from the alluvial deposits and we can go actually deeper and we can see this, this sandstone unit. Yeah. And that's only really present in this, uh, beneath this river. Okay, so based on those, um, those, uh, TM transects, we can actually identify three different regions, which I've just grouped here. So we can have a high resistivity region proximal to the river. We can have a medium resistivity. Uh, I'm talking about this, the second layer in those previous sections that I just showed you. A medium resistivity coming down the center here, and then a low resistivity as we move further away from the river. And what we see actually is that that correlates quite well with the, the borehole electrical conductivity. So from hand pumps in the area, we can go around and we can measure the, the conductivity of, of the pore water. So we can see here that it's freshest towards the river and as we move away, it gets more, more uh, saline or more conductive. Yep. Okay. Good, and this is generally this is the good quality drinking water. So, yeah. Uh, okay, let's let's move on quickly, and we'll finish off this last case study. Um, so, I'm going to talk about Lake Sabaya in in South Africa now, and this is uh, South Southern Africa's largest natural groundwater fed lake with an area of around 50 kilometers squared. And it's an important natural resource and supplier of water in the region. Uh, it's also quite uh, ecologically significant, so it's one uh, it's a protected site under this uh, Ramsar Convention. Now, over the last 30 years, the lake level has fluctuated quite substantially, and this has largely been due to increasing eucalyptus plantation, uh, reduced rainfall and Hurricane events, which bring a lot of rainwater, actually increased drought. Uh, yeah. And this is a picture actually. So this is a, a a lake level from 20 years ago. This this would have been active, this this uh, stick here. So within 
last 20 or so years, the, the lake level has fallen quite substantially. And we can jump through some aerial images. And I, I think if you pay attention to this coast here, uh, you'll, you'll notice how it changes through time. And this is spanning roughly 10 kilometers from here to here. Yeah, so keep your eye on this position here. And we can see uh, as we move into the 2000s, 2010, we can see quite an extreme uh, change in the, the morphology of this uh, lake, lakeside. Also, if you pay close attention to this southern basin here, it's connected in 2005, 2010, still connected. And then moving on from 2015, it starts to become separated from this main basin. So the southern basin becomes separated from the main basin. Um, and this is a, a graph showing actually the aerial extent of the lake as, as sensed by some la, la, uh, Landsat images. So Landsat 5 in blue and Landsat 7 in orange throughout time. Um, and we can date back back to the 1985 and we can see actually these dynamics uh, through time, which I think is quite nice. And then uh, during around uh, 2015, 2016, there was actually separation of these these lakes. And that's where that what this blue line is, is uh, showing. Now, importantly, the southern basin has continued to the lake level has continued to fall, fall rapidly, whereas the, the large lake, the since uh, 2015, 2016 time, the large lake, um, the water level has remained quite consistent. So the question in this this uh, area then is, is why is this happening? And for that reason, this is why we did some, some geophysical mapping. Yeah, so we want to understand uh, basically the connection on, of this large lake in the north with the groundwater and also the south lake, southern lake uh, with the groundwater. And try to understand why this lake level is is falling much more rapidly now than than the large lake. So we've roughly got yes, we've got some black lines showing where we collected TTEM on land based with this quad bike system, and we've got white where we've driven this uh, water based system. And I'm going to show you two profiles: blue running around here, and red which runs all the way across all these lake. Uh, all the way to the north. And importantly, this blue transect goes through two boreholes. So again, quite limited geological data in the area, but we do have these two boreholes. And I think another maybe slightly point of interest, interesting point to note here is that this area here, this is referred to as a land bridge. So this is somewhere between these two lakes. Around about 1500 years ago, so in the around about year 400 to to 600 or so, there was uh, evidence of early uh, sediments here. So there's some some pottery that is actually you can find in these sand dunes. So although this this land area was covered uh, as early as recent as 2014, maybe uh, thousands of years in the past, actually it was it was dry again. So there's there's an interesting cycle going on in this in this um, area. OK, but well, let's finish with some quick, quick TTEM results. So we're showing again um, this this profile one and passing the two boreholes and we've got good agreement between some dry is dryish sand in the boreholes and some more clear rich wet sand uh, beneath that. And then some calcareous sandstone in the bottom. And actually what we're seeing uh, deeper with depth is this very conductive unit, which is associated with um, Cretaceous aquifer, which is very saline in this in this area. So generally in, in this area, all the boreholes stop just before this calcareous, sorry, stop before this Cretaceous uh, saline aquifer. Uh, of course, it looks in this image, it looks like maybe we're, we're penetrating this uh, saline rich layer, but it could this could just be a, a artifact of interpolating onto the the profile. In general, there's very good agreement of the geophysics and the geology. Um, I'll just also point out here in the lake, we've also got a, a very organic rich silt mud layer called Guccia, which has been mapped previously. And actually we can see some of that in the, the TEM 
transect. I'll show you in the, in the next slide. So it's just important just to to mention that. Yeah, but if you recall, I'm showing you this profile that's ranging from south here all the way up across this land bridge and then back onto the lake, the northern lake, and then a little bit on land again. So this is a, a long transect, um, 11 kilometers in length, um, going across first the small lake and then and then the large lake. And what we're seeing here, again, if we refer back to the, the geology, we can see some, some uh, unsaturated uh, zone sediments, which are responding with quite a high resistivity. Um, at deeper depths, we see this more saturated clay rich uh, sand unit uh, in, the, in these green colors uh, in both cases. And then with deeper depths, we actually begin to again see this Cretaceous chalk beneath beneath all beneath all this quaternary uh, cover. In the lake, we also see this uh, conductive anomaly, which is likely associated with these organic rich uh, clay sediments. Uh, and we can see that quite nicely here. And maybe also a little bit in the deeper lake, but not, not, as, not as clear. OK. But the, the, what we can see basically is that the, the small lake is not as well connected to the groundwater as the large lake. So whereas the large lake is cutting deeper into the sediments and it seems to be in continuity with these, uh, these, these deeper sand, uh, deeper sand units with, with higher water content, the lake uh, appears to be, the southern lake, sorry, appears to be disconnected from this, from this system. And that's probably likely why we're we've been seeing such a, a big fluctuation in the lake levels of the small lake in, in the past few years. Uh, to summarize, well actually let's just look um, again at some other data. So when we were there actually recently, the, the lake level in the large lake had, had gone so high actually that the the this uh, land bridge had breached and we had a, a river flowing from the large lake to the, the small lake. So this quite often, this is this has been the first time this has happened in the last seven years. But the there was quite a steady stream of water flowing for maybe four or five months from the two lakes, from the large lake to the small lake. And we can see actually in the in the small lake what this has done. So this is actually this is a tree that's maybe in reality, another three, two, three meters tall, and we can only see the top of it. So, in a matter of a few months, this uh, lake, this small lake system, has been flooded uh, with water from the large lake. So, there's a very interesting dynamic here where we've got connection on the surface between these two lakes, but there does not seem to be so much groundwater connection between the lakes. Uh, and understanding the levels in this small lake are very important because it's a, quite a, a large source of water in the southern basin. Uh, sorry, a large source of water to the area. So good, it's good to know what's going on here. OK, I think uh, then I'll, I'll summarize and then maybe there'll be some questions. So we can we can do some TM mapping of pollution to target target remediation monitoring wells. We can also use TM mapping and remote sensing to identify viable aquifers and areas of the aquifer that are maybe regularly exchanging surface water and therefore remaining fresh and uh, good to drink. And we also, also can do some TM mapping and remote sensing to understand um, how lake, uh, lakes are changing through time and, and the connectivity of those lakes to the groundwater. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, thank Paul. You. This was a very nice talk. Uh, so uh, now we're going to open it for questions uh, and uh, answers and discussions. Uh, so apparently some people are unable to put their questions in the Q&A uh, box. So I will monitor the chat as well uh, for that regard. And also, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and then uh, we will uh, also open it for you to ask directly your question uh, based on the order of uh, hands risen. All right, let's uh, let's do it. Let's go to the Q and A box and start from the bottom. So uh, Anna is asking: Is the primary aim of the waterborne TEM to look at water quality 
what is the maximum water depth that can be sampled, i.e. 100 meters or so? Do you get any information on lake sediments? Yeah, good questions. Yeah, so in a lot of cases, um, it could be related to quality, so we might want to know if there's some high conductivity water coming into the bottom of the lake bed or the river bed. But also we want to know about the structure of uh, uh, aquifers underneath lakes. Uh, so yeah, whatever we can sense on land, we could also sense in, in the water with the same sort of setup. The second question related to the, the depth of investigation or what can we actually resolve under the water is very much dependent on the salinity. So in the cases where we've got in, in the seawater, for example, we would probably not be able to penetrate uh, very, very deep. Maybe we might be limited to shallow, shallow bodies of water, maybe in the order of 10, 15, 20 meters deep. But if we've got fresh water, then uh, I think it's quite possible to to see see um, through water, maybe 40, 50 meters deep, as long as it's has a resistivity of around 10, 20 ohm meters. But it very much depends on the the setting, and maybe you would want to do some some synthetic modeling to test these these um, settings. Um, and you can also resolve, I think we can resolve some lake bed sediments as well. So I think in the South Africa example, we can see some organic rich sediments at the base of the, the lake. Awesome, thank you. So we're going to alternate between the chat and the uh, uh, Q&A. <clears throat> Uh, Emin, do you want to ask the question? Yeah, so <clears throat> question from um, uh, Prince Satiti. How does the pollution affect um, surface groundwater interactions? What factors control the transport of the plume? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of groundwater surface water interactions, uh, the, the interface between the two is actually very interesting because we've got a very unique environment where we've got supply of oxygen from the surface water and maybe and supply of maybe pollutant or contaminated water uh, from the ground. And these can actually lead to some interesting biogeochemical transformations. Um, yeah, but in terms of uh, the, the, the rate at which pollutants move, it's very much a, then a groundwater problem. So how, how fast uh, uh, what are the hydraulic gradients in the aquifer and what's the hydraulic conductivities of these aquifers? Yeah. So, yeah. So the next question again from Prince is that uh, what are the groundwater levels in the site and what are the flow directions? Can you even see that in M data? In which one? Sorry, in which site? Uh, the sites in general, but uh... oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, in in so actually, so my colleague Anners in a few weeks he'll be talking directly about this about detecting groundwater levels with monitoring Tim. So if you're interested in this area, you should tune into that one. I I think it's it's around about mid January. But in these it examples, is. I've showed, um, I think in some cases we can track the the groundwater level. So in this case, the groundwater is actually quite well corresponding to this boundary between um, red and green. So between some dry sands and some more more uh, water saturated sands. Um, I think we also talked about, oh, this is maybe not the best way to do it, but in green still. Um, in Grinstall, um, the 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 hydraulic gradient is is towards this uh, lake system. I think I showed it. Was it here? Yeah. So we've got uh, the hydraulic gradient this way, but it's it's quite um, it's quite near the surface of the water table. And the the TM method in this case is not so well suited to track that boundary. If it's too close to the surface, we we don't get much resolution in the upper five, ten, ten five meters or so. So, in this case, we could not actually get the hydraulic uh, heads from the TM data. 
but it very much depends on the, the setting we have. That's good, thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, I take it from the chat from the Q&A box, uh, Sina. Yes, please. Yeah, please go. Uh, I don't think I can actually see the Q&A box. So um, perhaps if you take that one, that one. And also uh, the question owners, if you'd like to ask the question, please raise your hand. We actually have some hands. Maybe we can go to the hands. Uh, yep, Mont. Yeah. Should we take that? Yeah. I can uh, allow me. On mute. Yep, uh, Mont, uh, you're muted. Um, hopefully you should be able to ask the question. Oh, I can do it myself, I see. Cool. Okay. My name is Jaap Mons. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm wondering what is the frequency range of your 10 methods you're using and have you varied that for different areas? Um, yeah, so it's using a, it's using a, a turn, it's using, it's a transient signal. So it's in terms of, of a turn off um, time. But in some cases, for example, for the stationary instrument where we're using a, a longer turn off so we're actually able able to sense deeper in in the ground so that that can vary to some extent yeah okay thank you um, but yeah it thank depends you. again on, on the setting in of interest awesome so um the next question in the q a box is from lies uh, saying what kind of a regularization is used to solve the inversion problem uh, and then is direct model open source for that and technique or you use some closed source mm -hmm. software yeah so yes so the generally what we're when we model the data we generally just use a, a standard uh, smooth smooth inversion consisting of maybe 30 layers or something like that and we have spatial regularization so in the X and Y direction, so tying. So this the for the modeling code is a one dimensional code, so we need to have some spatial constraints tying these one dimensional models together. And we also have some vertical uh, vertical constraints, making sure that we get ge geologically reasonably reasonable models. Um, yeah. Uh, but those can we generally use some some fairly standard settings. And, and not not so much play around with the, the inversion settings to to make it fit with our for with our geological idea of the setting. So these are pretty robust settings. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Robust settings that we get quite reasonable results from. In terms of the code being open sourced, it's not open source. Uh, but for research purposes, you can you can request a a, a copy to to do some some modeling. The, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's my answer. Thank you. Um, are there any questions that, are there anyone who would like to ask the question? Uh, um, the speaker, please let us know, raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Uh, Kennedy has a question, Paul, what's the rainfall pattern in the area? Because this question was asked towards the end of the webinar, so that maybe explains also the area. Sorry, what was the what was the question? What's the rainfall pattern in the area? In which area? In in Zimbabwe? Um, it mm, most probably it is Zimbabwe. Yeah. Or South Africa. Yeah, uh, I've I've got some rainfall data from some Zimbabwe, so I'll, I'll talk about Zimbabwe. So this is. Um, yeah, I skipped over this in the interest of time, but this is a image, a plot here showing the, the seasonal variability of precipitation. And we can see that the highest precipitation is happening in uh, December, January time. And we get this very seasonal, seasonal pattern. Um, interestingly, well, I think it's interesting, at least is we've got a little bit of a lag between, between the maximum surface water percentage cover and and the precipitation event so this probably we probably uh, is related to the larger catchment of this river um, yeah 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but yeah. OK. So uh, we have one hand risen. So uh, the, the, the first one is from uh, uh, Ab 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 Abhishek. Sorry if I butchered your name. Um, please go ahead and ask your question. You should unmute yourself, be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Hi. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, it was a nice presentation. So I would like to know whether we can, uh, like, have you used any other geophysical method apart from DEM for this area? Um, so, yeah, for, in, um, so in, in Grinstall, the pollution site in, in Denmark, there's been some uh, DCIP and resistivity imaging done for a more targeted approach. So if we're, I think the nice thing about the TM, TOAD TM is you can you can really cover the whole area. But if you want, if you know a specific area you want to look at, you can use some DCIP or uh, DCERT. In for uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe, quite often what is done is VES is used a lot. Um, but I was personally not involved in, in this collection of data. But quite often prior to drilling, uh, people will carry out VES, uh, vertical electrical soundings. Uh, to understand the structure. Um, aside from that, I, I'm not. I don't know any more data, geophysical data used in this these settings. Like I'm using G. Uh, I'm working with GPR uh, mainly. So, what is the potential of GPR in this area, like for this study? Yeah, actually, GPR was used a lot in Sabaya. So, I, yeah, I forgot about this. But for understanding uh, the so in in Sabaya in South Africa there's a lot of dune sedimentation and a lot of interesting structure and GPR was used in this area a lot to characterize the structure and uh, maybe this helps with their geological understanding of the area but also helps us to understand maybe flow paths in in the groundwater but in in terms of GPR in these areas I've not had personal experience with those Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next question we have from um, uh, Christian. Uh, if you would like to unmute, um, uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, I'll ask the question. We can hear Hello. you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear. Oh, thank you. I've actually dropped the question in the chat box. Which other geophysical method can be used for this purpose? And why was um, CHM chosen for your work? Thank you. Um, I think, did you see which other methods to begin with? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of large scale characterization, where we want to understand the region or the sub-regional spatial extent, I think the, the TOAD TM method is very nice because we can get very high productivity. Uh, okay. You know, characterizing maybe 20, 50 kilometers per day. And I don't think that would be possible with ERT or or, or, or GPR or so. So that's why we, mm -hmm. we focused on TEM, TOAD TM specifically for mm -hmm. these case studies. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. The next question uh, from Chad. There are two questions. I'm going to combine them because they're asking for the uh, specifics of the device and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, is, uh, the first question is why the source coils and the sensing coils are separated, and the next question is what was the frequency of the um, mapping? Um. Yeah. The, so the, I think I'm not I'm I'm not so much uh, expert on the in the device development, but I believe the the receiver and the transmitter in the toad system. I'm just getting back to that image. They're they're separated in order to allow for more shallow characterization. So if we 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 place these coils apart, we can we can uh, get nearer surface resolution 
Whereas in the case of the, the stationary TEM, we have a central loop configuration and we can we can see deeper with this setup. And then with with the measure, do you mean measurement frequencies as a, how how often we're recording measurements or I'm not quite sure about the frequency question, what it's meant. So maybe, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe I can, uh, can answer you can this. Raise your, uh, if I'm in a, I think you can uh, raise your hand and ask this question if you want yourself. Yeah, we have, I think, if I'm in, is, uh, in the chat, so can I allow the mic? Um, yes, well, uh, yeah. Anna Leslie, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, um, thanks for the nice presentation. My question related to the second case study, um, the transects were really interesting, um, mm -hmm. seeing the change in the ground conditions. Um, I didn't understand the point of the case study, though. Was it to identify areas where you could drill for groundwater? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. so the idea was to, to see where we can actually uh, access uh, better quality drinking water. Yeah, so okay. first first under identify some aquifers and then the the satellite imagery was thrown in a little bit to uh, understand uh, why the why the water is fresher, groundwater is fresher proximal to the river. And was there any correlation between the satellite image and those high resistivity areas within the TEM? Were you able to see that visually? Yeah, um, no, not not with the high resistivity areas, but further in the south, actually. So we did some surveying in the south, and quite often when we've got um, very clay rich soils, there's there's a different vegetation, and you can see this in the aerial imagery, and you can also see it in the geophysics where you've got a very conductive subsurface. So that area was better correlated. But in terms of these resistivity, high resistivity um, alluvial channels, not not so much. Okay. And how many wells were drilled in the end? Um, they're still, I think, they're in the middle of planning or or carrying out two wells in this in this uh, refugee camp uh, here, and they're going to drill them pretty close to this river. Yeah, but I'm not. I don't Thank think it's actually gone. It's gone ahead yet. Yeah, some delays or something. Yeah. Thank you. No, not no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question in the uh, and the, the last one, I guess, in the Q and A is uh, from uh, uh, I can't see the whole name unfortunately, so I'm just gonna say the question. Sorry, uh, out of loop M array T dem array of T tem system is supposed to be more sensitive to magnetic viscosity effects. Have you seen such effects on your data? Um, I do not know about, yeah, I'm not sure about magnetic viscosity or how it would influence the signal. Generally, what we do is we we go through and we process the, the data quite closely and we're looking for features that might be related to infrastructure or, or device malfunctions. Um, I'm not sure exactly what what magnetic viscosity anomalies would look like in the the geophysical data. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more hand raised uh, raised in the in the call. It's uh, Mittel Sage. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? It disappeared. All right. And let's go to the chat. Do we have more questions in the chat box? Uh, Answer. Some people say they can unmute themselves. So let, and uh, so right now you should be able to do that. We we just uh, or we have to allow you to do that. We allow you, and then you should unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my question is referring to the first case study about the Denmark pollution plume, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how often would you recommend to conduct these surveys to monitor the plume? And is the cost of the survey dictating how often you will uh, conduct the surveys? Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting question. I think that the plume is not moving particularly fast. 
Um, so within, so they stopped adding the the the, the, the sorry the landfill closed. It was in the late 70s, and since then it's not not moved too far. So I I think it's actually moving pretty slowly this plume. And then the problem maybe with doing some time lapse TM in this case is eventually the plume will will migrate to underneath these these houses. Um, and in that case, it might not be such a good target. But in theory, we could we could do some time lapse TM. So maybe Anor's next time we'll talk about this. We've been looking at some salinization of a uh, aquifer in in southern Denmark, uh, and we've been doing repeat surveys uh, every six months or so, something like that. Uh, so it could be done. Uh, in, the, in this case, I don't think it's such a good uh, application because really here we've just guided where the, the monitoring well should go and then the monitoring wells uh, can be used for in future to understand how this plume is evolving. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. So I guess we have one more uh, hand, uh, Silla. Oh, it's a fem. If I'm in a, uh, try a mute disable. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Awesome. So, uh, that, that was a very good presentation, Paul. So I was Thank wondering, you. I asked uh, the question of what frequency your team was operating on. So mm -hmm. meaning because you your data was showing some depth resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think I'm seeing about uh, 50 meters, right? Yeah, it's depending on the conductivity of the subsurface. So sometimes 50 meters can be maybe up to 100 meters depth, depending on, yeah, the, if the, okay. the subsurface is very conductive, it, it attenuates the signal basically, and we don't get as deep penetration. Okay, so so that that was why I was asking what uh, frequency did you use for your imaging, because that uh, depend on the frequency, right? Yeah. Yes. And also the the subsurface structure. Yes. Thank you very much. And I think there is one last question in the chat. Uh, so. There is one last question in the chat that says, uh, unfortunately, the Q&A is not working for me. That's apparently some problem. Uh, the T-Temp has shallow hidden layer. The minimum thickness may be around five meter, and the remote sensing data will have shallow coverage. To what extent will these two methods have a common region to characterize the surface water, groundwater interactions? Confident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, in terms of overlapping signal, I would say uh, not so much, but in terms of um, overlapping like uh, area of interest or overlapping conclusion we can draw, I think the, the application is good. So for, for example, from remote sensing, we can see areas of high groundwater formation potential. And then from the TTEM, we can better understand the subsurface uh, structure of aquifers. But, but I wouldn't say no, a direct spatial overlap in signature is not, it's not something to, to be seen from, from these two methods. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Shelby S uh, in the chat. Awesome informative talk, uh, thank you. What kind of equipment should I look into to recreate this type of interaction studies for my area. Perhaps, Shelby, if you're in the, in the call, you would like to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Perhaps you can also give some information on, so, to, so the question can be answered in, in an interactive way. If not, I could, hands. Yeah. I could answer the questions. Maybe sure, it's, please. yeah, maybe it's better maybe if, to reach out and we can we can talk about maybe the application of of what you're interested in doing and maybe how to form some collaboration. I think that could be good. 
Yes, and, and uh, yeah. I see that there is several several questions in the chat box asking for publications or links to that. Yes, that goes in. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, the this webinar is recorded and will be available on the Slack group that we have. But also, okay. if you're not part of our hydrogen physics Slack group, please join. You just have to email Laurie, which is nsseg.org, to get an invitation. And then you can directly ask uh, Paul in there for the more resources available. Um, mm -hmm. That would be the best way, in my opinion. And also, you would get the recording, obviously. Uh, we have uh, uh, another hand reason, uh, Marjan. Please uh, unmute yourself. You should be able to do that. You Hi, uh, do you have my voice? Yes, we do. Uh, OK, hello. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I just have a short question. I just wanted to know, uh, you think it's the best geophysical method for this kind of studies, or you recommend some other methods also or not? Mm -hmm. I think for this spatial coverage, yes, it's very nice. It's um, it's uh, You can get high high resolution higher resolution than, for example, uh, airborne systems. Uh, but you can also get quite high spatial coverage and very high productivity. Uh, if And it's good, for example, for mapping large areas and understanding more about, about the system. If we want to do some targeted approaches where we want to maybe know the temporal dynamics of um, some interactions or some plume development of push, and then I would, I think maybe some ERT monitoring would be a better route to go down. But in that case, you need to specifically target where you want to be monitoring. And for uh, remote sensing, you used uh, Sentinel images? Yeah, I used a combination of Sentinel images and also Landsat 5 and 7 images. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of things you can do with with these and, products. Uh, uh, I think you also had a drone uh, for uh, making video or something, taking picture. <laughs> uh, you oh, yeah. couldn't use uh, the pictures of drone for uh, remote sensing also, for example, with a thermal camera or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess in theory we could. Uh, we, we looked a little bit at building, building a, a high resolution digital elevation model from the drone data, um, but in many cases, uh, so in some of these cases, we didn't really revisit, so we could not do some temporal monitoring, with some drone images. So in that case, it's it's, it's useful to use these uh, pre pre-made uh, Sentinel or, or Landsat missions. Okay, in thank theory, you. Yes, we could we could. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a great talk, Paul. And uh, you have done exciting work, uh, and and we we were happy to have you. Uh, if yeah. there are no more questions, which I think uh, they're not, uh, uh, we I would like to conclude this session uh, and uh, just let you know we have a uh, on January seventeenth uh, again we have a similar talk uh, by a colleague of Paul actually. Uh, uh, please join our. Uh, uh, Slack group so you could get the reminders of these webinars. And uh, uh, we look forward to have you for the next session, which is also another joint webinar with uh, uh, Europe Regional Advisory Committee and SCG Hydrogen Physics Subcommittee. Um, we are trying to have these more, and uh, so we, we we kind of combine two, two groups and have uh, really interesting talks. Uh, uh, if uh, Eamon, Paul, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, thank you for hosting me and also thanks to those who attended. I think, yeah, it was a, a good good experience. Awesome. And thanks yep, for the thank questions thank as, as well. Yeah. Sorry. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you to both to, to Paul for presentation. Thank you for Sina uh, and, uh, and the SCG and um, organizing and um, this webinar and uh, we see you again. See you everybody. See you. Enjoy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Bye.